Well, hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us today. My name is Craig Vernon, and uh, with me is my esteemed colleague, Mark Stokes. Good morning. And thanks for uh, taking the time out of your busy lives to uh, get a little bit of an FME desktop and uh, an FME server introduction. Um, so a couple of housekeeping on the GoToWebinar control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you want to fire away some questions, we'll do everything we can to answer them today during the next 55 minutes or so. Um, and of course, if uh, we can't, then uh, we will take it offline and follow up with you after that and, uh, and continue on uh, assisting you. So today is not uh, training. It's really an overview, kind of opening the can of worms, so to speak, of, of what FME can do and how it might be able to help you and your organization. We'll go through a quick and dirty safe software overview of the company um, and introduce you to FME Desktop. And then Mark's going to dive into some into a fantastic uh, demo. Um, we'll touch base towards the end a little bit on FME Server and just show how those two products are integrated. Um, and then we'll do a wrap up. And of course, there's always uh, opportunity for free online training. And uh, we'll show you how to get that and all of the other resources. Yeah, and um, do ask questions as we go. I encourage you to do that. Absolutely. So we can certainly try and answer them as we go. All right. So, Mark, we're located just uh, south of, of, uh, of Vancouver, British Columbia, in a suburb called Surrey, about 40 minutes south. Uh, we're around 95, give or, give or take, uh, exuberant employees. There's probably one or two not so exuberant <laughs> at times. Um, and, uh, yeah, we've been around for almost 20 years now. And, I mean, uh, is it that long? Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's coming up for that. Yeah. Whoa, that was cool. So um, this is uh, just a quick overview of uh, the FME capabilities that we have. Um, our main... Uh, reason for producing software is to help you translate uh, data from one format to another. It does say spatial data, but we do support a lot of non-spatial formats as well, so we'll talk about that a little bit uh, this morning. And um, we have these spatial, well, these different formats in very different uh, spatial and non-spatial contexts. So we originated in the CAD and GIS um, ar arena. Uh, AutoCAD, MicroStation, Shape and Map Info type files. Uh, broaden the scope of our format into GIS databases. I think ArcSDE was our very first database format. And since then we've been adding very different spatial types of data structure. Uh, raster data, point cloud or LIDAR information, 3D and related BIM building information management data sets. And uh, more recently, cloud um, data s formats, which come in a wide variety. Uh, Amazon Web Services have a database called Redshift. We're adding that. Uh, Google has a few um, formats in the cloud. Uh, Google Spreadsheets is one that we can read and write. And of course, non-spatial data, flat files like CSV, uh, just even text files. Uh, some XML is non-spatial and the non-spatial databases like SQL Server or Oracle, they don't always have spatial data attached. So to help us get data across from these very disparate data structures, we have added a wide range of transformation tools to help you move the data and uh, get the best out of your data. Yeah, so we work with uh, a large uh, number of organizations and, of course, traditionally on the GIS side where we started, um, we, we uh, work with uh, groups like Esri. In fact, they, you might be familiar with a product they call the Data Interoperability Extension, and that is our product that uh, we bundled in uh, to their product offering that they sell. Um, and we work with uh, Intergraph and Bentley, Pitney Bowes, Autodesk, and a lot of those organizations have our product embedded into their um, applications yeah, as to, well. Yeah, to a greater or lesser degree, I guess. Yeah. yeah, and of course a wide variety of database and traditional uh, ETL type of organizations all partner with us as well. So we have two primary products uh, here at Safe Software, the FME Desktop, which we're going to be focusing on today. And then the FME server product, which is a scalable platform that leans on everything you've done uh, in the desktop environment. You build your workflows and translations in the desktop environment. And then you can publish those workflows to the server to give a wider audience uh, access to those workflows so that they can run them 
in interesting ways. So we will just touch on that at the end of the webinar. And uh, as Craig said, there is a separate, uh, a fuller, more complete uh, webinar on that covers the uh, FME server that you can register for. This is a graph of uh, our format history over time, the number of formats that we've supported. So this release, we cracked the 300 formats that uh, FME supports, um, that we support in FME, I guess. We do have partners who also support and uh, through our plugin builder have added uh, custom formats to FME or plugins and they distribute those uh, separately. So there's probably 30 plus of those yeah, uh, yeah. as well formats that other uh, partners of ours have added to FME. So it is uh, important to be able to plug into the right data structures that you want to read or write. That's obviously that's a given. Um, but uh, so f having the right format reader and writer in our uh, tool is, is important. But actually we see the data model or the data transformation as being the real problem because if you're moving from one uh, data structure to another, you need to be able to get the best out of your source data in that destination data set. And so we have these transformation tools that allow you to do that. And uh, so you can plug into one a, a source format and plug that into a destination format, but we have a wide range of transformation tools to help you get the best out of your data. In the FME desktop uh, product, uh, the application that you use to build these workflows is the FME Workbench. It's a GUI-based uh, work uh, environment that allows you to build these repeatable workflows. The whole idea is that you build a workflow that you can then run again with a slightly different uh, data set or a new delivery of the data. So you build these workflows on the canvas. You add a reader, which are the brown objects on the left of that uh, image there. You add a writer, which are, is the tables that you want the destination, the data to end up in. And in the middle there, the blue objects are the transformation tools that uh, rejig the data as it passes through uh, FME. So just having a look at some of the transformation tools that we do have, there's a wide variety of these tools, uh, over 400 of them, and they vary uh, in their level of sophistication. So some of the attribute uh, transformation tools that we have, a string concatenator and attribute splitter that are illustrated here. So uh, these uh, two tools are just examples of taking at attribute values, so string concatenator, taking different fields in a database table, for example, and stringing them together into a single address field. Or you can do the uh, inverse of that, which is to split out a single field in, uh, into multiple fields if you have nicely structured uh, data uh, there. Attribute value mapper is an example of taking values and uh, remapping them so that might be an example of going from a CAD system where you have very descript descriptive um, text values and you need to load those into a database that has domains or enumerated lists so the descriptive values get mapped across to domain values. And uh, on the right hand side there we've got an illustration of the transformer gallery which uh, has categories in it and we're looking at the string category and that's just got a sample of some of the string uh, tools that we have in FME fairly straightforward ones like string concatenator and attribute splitter and then more sophisticated ones like string replacer that allows you to use uh, extended regular expressions to uh, search for string patterns, same with the string searcher there, and replace uh, patterns um, using uh, fairly sophisticated uh, searching tools. And similarly on the geometric side, uh, there's quite a few transformation tools for uh, restructuring your geometries. Uh, they vary again from the relatively straightforward, like the clipper, you can take uh, clip polygons um, and we call them clippies, the areas that you want to clip and uh, those are broken out. And uh, to more sophisticated uh, tools like the spatial filter that looks for um, spatial overlaps, different types of spatial interaction, you can choose what kind of interaction in inside, touches and so on and uh, those uh, can be um, 
a run through the spatial filter to do spatial relationships. So again, fairly wide variety of uh, geometry transformation tools. So those are the tools that are sort of probably more oriented to the traditional CAD, GIS, and database users who might be doing sort of data model restructuring. But we also have tools for looking at some of the other formats and, and spatial uh, data structures that we support, like raster data. So there's a transformer gallery that helps you restructure your raster data. Uh, this illustrates just a fairly straightforward uh, taking tiles and mosaicing them together. Uh, there's an inverse of that. You, there's a tiler tool that allows you to take a mosaic and tile it out into um, a regular pattern of uh, imagery. And uh, again, here on Point Cloud, we've got tools for restructuring Point Cloud. That's an example. And this also illustrates kind of a bit of an interesting thing you can do in FME, and that is bring disparate data sets together and produce, um, again, a sort of a different re result or a different data structure. So this illustrates using Point Cloud data, probably picking out the ground return, and from that ground return, building a digital elevation model and then draping a raster image over that digital elevation model to produce a SketchUp or 3D PDF that you can use to view the data in a slightly different way to what the source data offers. So that's a kind of both a data merging and a restructuring kind of uh, workflow that you could put together within FME. And then there are other transformation tools that are sort of a bit more specialized in FME network kind of tools, tools for doing linear referencing, and then even sort of workflow management tools. So we have uh, transformers that allow you to trigger other workflows based on decisions that you've made in the current workflow. Seems a little odd to do, but in some sense you're using the FME uh, workbench as a, um, a scripting tool in, in some ways. And so the shortest pathfinder is one of the examples of one of the network tools that's there that uh, finds you the, the, the shortest distance on a network between a couple of points. But I think the main use of, the core use of FME is still around uh, data model transformation and data restructuring. That's probably the cornerstone of uh, data interoperability problems. And uh, what we can do in FME at a very fundamental level is restructure uh, feature types. Now, feature types is our generic term for the table structure that you have in, in the particular source or destination format. And so all of those formats use different names. Uh, in Oracle, it would be a table. In uh, Geodatabase, we would think of them as feature classes, maybe AutoCAD, it would be the layer. Uh, MicroStation, it would be the level. So um, each of those have a different way of grouping the data, so we call those feature types. Uh, we can restructure attribute names, rename attributes as they pass through FME to suit the destination data model that you're trying to write out to, um, and uh, restructure attribute values. We've given a couple of examples there with string concatenation and so on, and also uh, rejigging domains or enumerated lists. And then uh, if uh, necessary geometry restructuring. Interestingly, although we are uh, quite focused on um, spatial data in many ways, the most common tools that people use in FME are the non-spatial tools. Testing, filtering, renaming attributes, those kind of tasks, which are kind of very fundamental uh, data schema transformation tools. And the geometry in many cases, just sort of comes along for the ride from the source to the destination. Very fundamental part of FME around the spatial data is uh, coordinate transformations. So we have uh, a wide number of predefined coordinate systems, and uh, if you if the coordinate system doesn't exist, uh, we can help you define it. It's relatively easy to build a coordinate definition in uh, FME, and then have it available to all the users that are using FME in your organization. 
So the fundamental tool in the FME desktop is the workbench. Within the workbench, you build a workspace, which is this workflow that uh, defines what source data you're going to read from, where you want that data to go, and how you want the data to be uh, restructured in the middle. OK. Oh, can we go back one, Mark? Because um, this always comes up. So we have a, this, uh, this illustration. We've got all these blue transformers, and then we have a green transformer. What makes that uh, transformer so special? Yeah, green? so the green transformer there is, is a, we call it a custom transformer. And a custom transformer is really a grouping of existing transformers. And you might use that just to reduce the clutter in your workflow a whole bunch of uh, tools or transformation tools that you've put together to do something and you just want to reduce the clutter on the workspace. Or you can build a custom transformer to share with other people. And uh, we have an FME store where a lot of people put up custom transformers that sort of do specific methodologies that uh, they think others might be able to reuse. And so you can package up some work that you've done and share it either inside your organization or publish it up on the FME store so that uh, others can use it. Yeah, thanks, Craig. OK, thanks. So um, we're using, what are we using SP2 today? Or SP2? Actually, I'm using SP2, yeah. Okay. As, uh, Service Pack 2 just came out uh, last week. Right, so um, the current release that you can get from our website, and this slide needs to be updated, but is FME 2013 SP2. Um, and so we released uh, 2013, the very beginning of March, end of February. And so the reason we do service packs, um, yes, it could be because we're adding a bunch of functionality like this current release. Um, but often it's because we're, we are keeping up with, with um, what other applications are doing in databases and that sort of thing. Because we don't want to wait, have our customers wait. So if our, uh, if, it, if our GIS comes up with a new, or our GeoDatabase comes up with a new version, we don't want our customers to have to wait eight months or so for that. Yeah, so, so for compatibility reasons, we yes. might add, uh, add that to the service pack. <laughs> OK, and so in that illustration in the center is the FME base edition. That's a very entry level. Um, does things like shapefile, DWG. Um, does not include um, a lot of our transformers. For the most part, uh, you would the entry level for most organizations would be the professional edition. So that includes reading um, the vast majority of all the databases and all of the transformers that, that we have. And as you move to the outer rings, it includes all the functionality of the products in the inner ring. So if you're loading GeoDatabase, um, then you would need the FME Esri edition, and that includes all of the functionality within the professional edition. If you were to load uh, Oracle Spatial, Microsoft SQL Server, um, and, or Teradata for that matter, then you'd need one of those editions, um, and that would include all the functionality in the rings um, inside of that. So, and on the other outer ring would be Small World if you're working with uh, with Small World uh, database. Um, application, then uh, you'd need the FME Small World Edition. We have fixed licenses, so those are tied node lock to one machine, and then uh, floating licenses where we set up a, a license um, server and you can expose FME to a greater number of people. Yeah. So, All FME right. Desktop Demo, let's have a look at uh, something in uh, FME Desktop and get a feel for how that uh, works. Where I'm going to start, actually, is not in the FME Workbench, but in uh, a secondary application that we have in FME Desktop, which is called the Data Inspector. So the Data Inspector is a simple graphical display tool for allowing you to check out the data that you're going to read or write and uh, see how FME might uh, feel like interpreting it. That's really useful if uh, somebody gives you, say, an AutoCAD file. They want you to get that into your geodatabase that perhaps you're not an AutoCAD user and you can't, you don't have AutoCAD to open that file up and inspect it. So uh, the data inspector will allow you to do that. Open up that AutoCAD file, discover what's uh, inside it, discover the kind of layers, whether it looks like it's clean data or uh, whether it's going to take quite a lot of effort to clean it up and make it sort of GIS compatible. So what we have here is uh, some sample data that I've got from uh, electronic navigation charts for the San Francisco Harbor area um, that I've loaded into a SQL Server database. It's spatial, both spatial and non-spatial, so we've got the beacons here, 
um, somewhere uh, they they are in other features. And it's also non-spatial. I've got a vessel database that is a description of uh, all vessels and names and some of the vessel characteristics that sort of float around the San Francisco Harbor area, I guess. And then in blue here, we've got some uh, AIS data, Automated uh, Information System, I think that stands for. And um, those are essentially GPS signals that ships have to uh, push out uh, from their transponders to describe their location and what kind of activity they're doing um, for marine um, reasons, I guess. Anyway, what we're going to do today is, as a simple example, is just to um, read a subset of this data, these blue dots, which are the GPS signals uh, from this AIS package, and uh, sort of uh, read the data in, and then take a series of the GPS points for a few of the, the vessels and make a vessel track from them, and then join that data to the vessel database that I've tabled, that I've got here. So that's where we would start to use uh, FME uh, Workbench. Okay, so this is the FME Workbench when you first start up. Uh, and uh, there's the actual Workspace Canvas, which starts up uh, blank when you first get going. And for most users who get going here, where they generally start is uh, using the Generate Workspace dialog. Uh, there's an equivalent wizard if you're kind of a wizardy type person, but uh, generally we prefer this. So the data I'm going to start with is uh, a CSV version of that um, uh, AIS data. Uh, whoops. And we've got some data here in the demo data sets. So these are the GPS tracks here. Uh, most of our readers and writers have parameters that uh, change the way that the detailed way that a read and writer might uh, behave. So in this case, uh, we have field names on the first line here checked off. Uh, if you didn't have that checked off, it would give you very generic column names. So that's the kind of thing you can do there. FME, CSV is not a very intelligent um, format. So FME is doing its best to try and figure out what uh, kind of uh, attributes you've got in there and uh, trying to interpret whether they're numbers, strings, and so on. Uh, so we're getting that uh, out as well. And if you wanted to, you could actually change that. Uh, we could say the navigation status is a, uh, a text or number, depending uh, what we thought it was. The other thing we can do here is to interpret the latitudes and longitudes. So we can switch this from being a number uh, to an x coordinate. So longitude is x and uh, latitude is uh, y. And so now FME will spatialize that uh, CSV data as it uh, reads in and generate a point from each of those uh, CSV files. We might also want to tag that with a coordinate system. So we know that these uh, AIS uh, data sets come in that long, so I'm going to I would treat them as uh, WGS84, and uh, so that's our reader all set up. Then we're going to go out to uh, uh, File Geodatabase uh, for today. So this is a good place to talk about uh, Esri products, I guess, because they are quite prevalent. Yeah, they're uh, used for by a lot of our uh, customers. Quite a few sure. of our customers. Yeah. And uh, so this is the, the writer or the format gallery that you can see. And some of them are sometimes grayed out. Uh, that might be because you don't have uh, licensing for, the, uh, for this particular format. Uh, or it might be that a special um, application uh, interface needs to be installed to get this run. So in this case, uh, I've got uh, the Autodesk map guide, the older version of that. So we would need to ins install the older API to get that working. Uh, if it was Oracle, if I didn't have an Oracle client uh, installed here, then uh, my Oracle uh, objects would be, um, formats would be grayed out because it wouldn't be able to read or write without a, an Oracle client. Let's have a look at the uh, Esri uh, formats. In particular, the geodatabase ones are worth talking about because they are common formats. And uh, in 
all the cases of uh, geodatabase FME needs uh, the geodatabase API installed, which generally means a version of Arc, um, ArcGIS installed, because FME uses Arc objects uh, to read and write from the geodatabases. And then when we actually do the read or write, FME needs to check out a uh, geodatabase license, uh, an ArcGIS license. Um, so those are the requirements for Azure Geodatabase. Now, the one exception to that really is a special uh, version of the file geodatabase API that Esri released. And uh, that is, allows you to read or write simple features to file geodatabases. And uh, you don't need a ArcGIS installed, and you don't need an ArcGIS license. So by simple features, I mean points, lines, and areas doesn't allow you to read or write uh, annotations or uh, more complex structures like networks or relationship tables and those sorts of things. But if you're not an Esri user and you've been asked to read a geodatabase, you can get the basic data out using this uh, API. If you are an Esri user, you can use the fully, fully fledged uh, geodatabase uh, read and writer, which is the, the one that's based on uh, ARC objects here. So that's one I think I'll use today. Uh, there might be a few parameters that you want to check off there. Uh, overwrite an existing geodatabase. Do you want to just start from scratch or do you want to uh, um, uh, add to an existing geodatabase and so on. So they can all be set and then we need to say where we want this thing to go. So I think I've probably got uh, um, demo three. We'll start again. And uh, that should get us going. So what's FME going to do? It's looking at that CSV file, trying to interpret the attributes in that CSV file. And then because we haven't told it anything else, we're going to write uh, out to a geodatabase table. Um, it's using the same table name. So CSV is a very generic table name, CSV. And so we might that might be the first bit of schema mapping we do here is to change uh, the, the name of the feature class that we're going to write out to, so we could call them vessel um, locations or something like that. And we could also here, this is where we could start to do some fine tuning of uh, our attribution. We can remove um, attributes if we don't uh, think uh, that they're going to be used. Um, we could uh, add additional attributes here if you type them in, or we could rename any of the attributes in that table as well. All right, so we have, I'm going to just uh, break that link there for now. Um, and what we're going to do is start to build a workflow. So the first thing I might do is I might want to say, well, I am reading the CSV file. And I've tried to have it interpret the latitude and longitude as a coordinate. So what does that look like? Am I doing that successfully? So here's where we can start to add transformation tools. And the first one we can add um, is a visualizer. So if I right click on here, we have a, a, a special a shortcut to adding an inspector. So this is our first transformer that we're adding. And if I just say go, it's going to run that, read that data, and uh, pop that up in the inspector. And there's that uh, particular vessel track. So we've got three vessel tracks that I've thinned out of that original data set, just for demonstration purposes and uh, experimentation purposes, I guess. And so there they are. And uh, they're all going into San Francisco Harbor. We have the ability to turn on and off uh, background maps in the inspector, just so that you can get a feel for where the data is in a very uh, um, simple sense. That's actually relatively new to FME. You can turn them off there. Um, and so we will be adding more uh, different variants of background maps. At the moment, we're supporting this uh, mapping service called Stammen Maps, which is based on OpenStreetMaps. And the Stammen folks uh, are taking those uh, OpenStreetMaps and rendering them out into quite nice maps, I think. Um, if you're an ArcGIS Online uh, subscriber, you can uh, use ArcGIS Online maps. And uh, you can then go into their map service and uh, choose from all the ArcGIS Online maps that uh, are available. Doesn't look like we've got a very good connection to the outside world today. 
But um, anyway, right. So, oh, there we go. And so we can choose uh, from uh, the coordinates list of different ArcGIS online maps uh, what might be uh, uh, useful. I find the World Street Map uh, a really nice one there. But that will only come up in the next uh, display uh, that we create uh, in the inspector here. Okay so, okay, so sorry, Mark. You're going to be using. Is there a limit to number of inspectors? First of all, like I'm assuming that you can have more than one up at once. Does that cause a conflict? Normally, we don't have up one more than one. But what we do is create new views. I see. So just across here, there's the original view that I'd set up of the source yep. data and the kind of work data we're working with. And now we've got a new view of that uh, intermediate run that we've just done, just making sure we interpreted the CSV file. Okay, so you're going to use the inspector as a way to vet your workspace. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So cool. I'm happy with that now. I'll get rid of that. And so I'm now actually going to add the first transformer. Uh, we've got a transformer gallery. We were looking at in the slides. Lots of different uh, uh, categories in here that we can use, filters for uh, filtering data, testers and test filters and so on database tools that we'll look at a little bit more later on. But once you become familiar with uh, FME, you can start uh, just uh, typing on the canvas here. So I'm going to, uh, I know the transformer name, so I'm going to type it in, the point connector. So what I want to do is I want to string together those uh, GPS points and uh, make a vessel track out of them. And so there we connect that up. Uh, and uh, there might be some parameters on this transformer that we want to set and the parameter we want to set is when do we start a new line, break connection attribute and that will be the vessel ID that we use here. So there we go, use the vessel ID and uh, again connect a group of inspectors to see what kind of output geometries we might be getting from our line point connector tool and uh, it's uh, producing, it looks like a series of lines and points here. So we've got little line segments and then um, some individual points, a few more line segments. So what's going on there? That's probably not the result we're expecting. We're expecting to see three uh, vessel tracks. And that's because these GPS signals are all going off uh, at uh, the same time. So this ship might uh, send off a GPS signal and then this ship uh, and then the ship sends another one and uh, back to this one. So basically our CSV file is not well structured, it's uh, unsorted as it were. So we might want to clean up our data and that's a very common thing you'll find as you're working with the data as it comes into FME. You have sort of one expectation of your data and then you find out that it has nuances that uh, need to be addressed. Mark, before you go there, what are those numbers on those lines? It starts with like 480 something and then... Mm -hmm. So 480. So that, these are, this is a great way of also uh, assessing your workflows and seeing if you're getting the results that you're expected. So we were expecting to get three vessel tracks which would be basically three lines out of the line port on the point connector. So these numbers are the number of features or records that we read. So we read 480 odd features from the CSV file. It went through the point connector and uh, it connected some of them together into lines. We got 96 little line segments and then 117 points that didn't connect to other lines. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add a sorter transformer to reorder my CSV data and uh, so the sorter has parameters. It's got a red button there saying that this transformer is probably not going to work if you don't do some um, setting of some of the parameters here. The attribute that we're going to set is uh, we're going to sort by vessel name and uh, vessel ID, not vessel name, but vessel ID. This MMSI is the secret code for the vessel mm -hmm. identifier. And then we will sort by sequence number, which is also a numeric. The sequence number I derived from timestamps uh, uh, earlier on. Okay, and then we can rerun that. And again, if we look at that uh, result over here, we can see, yeah, we got a bit of a better result. Uh, we've got some lines coming out there. So that's good. And then uh, in the uh, inspector, 
there's the special tracks. We've got three lines now instead of uh, 400 points. And that's using the ArcGIS online? Um, and this is map. the ArcGIS uh, online uh, um, background map. That's correct. Yeah. OK, so at the beginning, we were looking at the original data that uh, we had. And we've got this uh, non-spatial vessel database. And so now we've got three vessel tracks. And what I want to do is use the MMSI number here to join that vessel track that we've built to this vessel database and see if I can pick out the vessel characteristics for these uh, three uh, ships that are coming in or out of uh, San Francisco Harbor. So we'll get rid of those point connectors. And then we'll add some database tools. So we have a lot of uh, fairly strong tools for working with databases in FME. And uh, so what I want to do is I want to read that vessel database, uh, the table called vessel database in my SQL server. So there's a number of ways we could do that. We could actually just go and add a, a second reader to our FME workflow. Um, bring it up, SQL server. It's a non-spatial table in SQL server. You could select that table. Uh, there it is at the bottom of the table list, um, and uh, it'll get added there. And then we've got th the three vessels coming out of here, so we would use some tool in FME to merge together these um, lines with uh, vessels coming in here. Uh, there, there, there are different times you might do this and uh, times you might not. In this case, that wouldn't be the best choice because what it would imply is that we have to read the entire vessel database and then figure out in FME which of those many records um, join to the three vessels we're interested in. So in that case, there would probably not be the approach we would take. So we do have a number of transformers that work with uh, databases that actually allow us to connect directly to a database midstream of our translation. Uh, SQL Creator and SQL Executor are transformers that actually allow us to throw arbitrary SQL calls uh, to, um, to a database. And so uh, you can, somewhere here is the, uh, yeah, so we could, if we had selected a database, we could be um, writing some SQL here. So we could say, select a star from whatever. OK, so that the SQL executor is a very powerful tool for just allowing you to throw custom SQL at a database. It doesn't actually have to return features. You can do anything in here. You can delete tables, build indexes, build spatial indexes, and uh, um, so on. So if you're a SQL user, you might uh, feel very comfortable with that. So I'm not a SQL user, so we'll just uh, avoid that one if we can. A feature reader is a very interesting one. It allows us to do more sophisticated spatial queries back to a database. We've got some online examples of that. What I'm going to use here is the joiner transformer. Drag that onto our canvas. And it's very, in some ways, very similar to the SQL executor, except you don't, uh, it's got it allows simple joins and it doesn't mean it means you don't have to know uh, any SQL. So this is kind of a simple join tool. And again, what we do is we say what uh, kind of um, a database we want to read from. Uh, we make that connection uh, with the parameters. I've saved those as my defaults. I'm going back to this database quite a bit, so I, I save the connection parameters as my defaults. We choose which table we want to read from that uh, database. So that's going to be my vessel database. And now we build the keys that we're going to use to join um, to the to database. So these are the attributes on the uh, feature coming in on the vessel track. And then this is the uh, attributes on the actual database table. So the key the attribute names are slightly different. So this is the feature attributes coming from our CSV file. And then these are the table uh, joints. And that could be a multi-part key. And we'll choose what uh, attributes we actually want to bring in. I'll just grab them all, I guess. Uh, there's a few ways that we can select how we want this join to be, the cardinality of the join. And that will produce different, slightly different results and some other, a few other 
tuning parameters, I guess you could say. And then connect inspector again, check those intermediate results, run this. We can see again, we've got uh, our 480 odd uh, records coming in from CSV, the three lines, three features coming out of the joiner. And uh, again, we can have a look at what that looks like in the inspector tool. And there we go. And so now what we would hope to be seeing uh, are some additional attributes. So we have the table view here which adds attributes as we go. Uh, so here are the additional attributes. So we added the vessel name, um, the, the number which we already have, tonnage and so on. So those are all the details of those vessels that we joined from the vessel database. And we also have a detailed feature information window that uh, gives us more gory details that uh, FME picks out from uh, specific formats. Uh, so, for example, when we're reading CSV files, we get these special format attributes that gives us a bit more detail about how we interpreted that CSV record. Uh, the number of fields that we actually read from that CSV record and the total number of fields that we're expecting on that record. So. That would allow us to do some QA. If there was a difference here, it would mean that our CSV file has got records of different lengths, uh, which we might want to uh, deal with, either reject or um, uh, warn the user that they've got some bad data. So the, uh, these sort of special attributes appear in the feature information window. And this is also where you can dig into uh, the attributes, click uh, the geometry click on the geometry and see where that uh, geometry is occurring there. So lots of tools for exploring your data. Okay, so we've read some CSV data, interpreted the lat longs as coordinates. We probably want to now write those to our vessel location table. But now we've built a vessel track over here and we need to build another tape feature class in our geodatabase to uh, accept those vessel tracks. So I can just right click here and say I want to insert a writer feature type which is in our case a new feature class and then I can build that manually. I can give it a table name, add my attributes, but uh, that would be a little bit tedious to do. So what I can do is I can steal the schema of the feature class I want to write to from somewhere else. So I'm going to go to the Writers menu and I'm going to say I want to import the feature types. If I had a geodatabase that already existed with the data model I wanted, then I would steal it from the geodatabase, but I don't have a geodatabase. But what I do have is I have a SQL Server table uh, with that vessel database information in it. So uh, we've already accessed that, so there it is there. And so now I'm going to look at that vessel database, but apply it to my geodatabase schema. And uh, so we can see we've got a geodatabase here. So let's rename that table to, well, what should we call it, Craig Vessel Tracks. Sounds good. Um, the original table has no geometry, but we're supplementing this table with some geometry, so we need to make sure that GeoDatabase knows what kind of geometry we're going to be loading in here. Uh, if we wanted, we could uh, change the attribute name slightly. We could add um, another uh, attribute. For example, we, could, we might be wanting to uh, add the um, uh, track length. We could calculate that in FME and uh, we could uh, throw that in there. So we can supplement the data if we wanted to. So now I'm going to connect that uh, to there. And so now, finally, once we've built this workflow, we can say, now I want to try writing this data to uh, the geodatabase. I'm just going to check that. Uh, here's the allowed geometries as well. We read from a CSV file which was essentially non-spatial, so we do need to make sure that we're writing and creating a point feature class in our geodatabase. So let's run that. Now, it's so long ago that um, I set this up at the beginning here that I've forgotten where my data was. So I can right-click on here and I can either open containing folder or I can just inspect 
that uh, geodatabase right off the top in uh, the data inspector. And so there we have the results of our data translation in the data inspector. We've got the vessel tracks uh, that I can turn off in the display control and we have the individual GPS points that we also loaded into a feature class. So there what I would want to do is um, I would want to save this workflow uh, and uh, I'm just going to save it as some fairly generic uh, name so that's okay. And uh, so then what would we do next? What happens if I wanted to let Craig run this thing and Craig doesn't have FLE installed in his machine? Uh oh, so that means I'm in trouble. I have to go and uh, Download purchase, FME, purchase, download, license, purchase new or what we can or do what? is we can say let's share this through FME server. So we can publish this workflow to our FME server and this is where the integration between FME and FME server comes on. So if you're a desktop user, you might just be, this is what you might just do. You're doing translations, you run them on the desktop and that's fine. If you have other people in your organization, uh, or somewhere that uh, needs some uh, needs to run those workflows and they don't really need to understand FME you can publish those workflows to FME server and uh, so here's my local FME server and I'm going to go in log in so this might be Craig on his machine logging into uh, an FME server on a web page it's going to go to a repository and um, We've got the Vessel Track repository there. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit, I'm afraid. This is the one that I did load up, but I haven't kept my FME server up to date oh, okay. with my FME desktop. So I can't run the one I just made there because my FME server is an older version than um, the version I've been running on my desktop, just because we just released uh, FME Service Pack 2. So we would be able to upgrade the engine for FME server, uh, probably do that uh, later this week and then uh, we would be compatible but I have this one that I preloaded up there so these are simple web pages these are example web pages we uh, configure uh, and publish for you and usually people take these web pages and brand them with their own organization tools they are just HTML and uh, JavaScript so uh, that's what we can do so here what I can do is uh, I can say which uh, files I want to run. Uh, this is the file we were working with, so let's uh, try running a, a different CSV file. So this would be Craig wanting to do the same analysis and get a geodatabase uh, of these uh, position points. I'm going to say which of those position points I want to select, which is that one there. If you are a developer, you can show see what uh, the actual call back to um, FME server looks like um, down here. So it's just a URL that we're sending back to the server, which tells us what workspace to run, where the data is coming from. If you want to build a web page, you can do that. Here's an example of what this uh, web page might look like if you want to build that yourself and integrate it into your own uh, web page. And uh, somewhere down here we can say run the workspace. Off it goes. So it sent that request back to the FME server. The FME server selected the correct workspace. And this is an F, uh, uh, basically an FTP link to the zip file that uh, contains the geodatabase that we've just created. So wait, so I just... Um, allowed you to build a potentially complex workspace. I don't have the product of FME. I don't want to know the FME, and it would be dangerous if you uh, wanted me to do something within FME. Exactly. But yet I was just able to use the power of FME without having any knowledge or even have to purchase the product. That's right. So that's how FME okay. desktop integrates with the server. So, except on my system, the FME server uses the same engine as the FME desktop. So anything that you're running on desktop, provided you keep them in sync, you can run on the server. allows you to do these transformations uh, with different web services. So the typical workflow in server is you have one or more desktop users who author and test and run spatial data transformations. 
And then somewhere in your organization or out on the cloud even, you would have an FME server running. And those uh, users publish their workflows to the server. And then they can just run them on the server themselves if they want to. But more importantly, we have people who can connect through different services and run those uh, workflows. As time goes by, you need to generally you need to maintain your workspaces so individual users can go and download their uh, workspaces, update them, change them slightly for new data, and then republish them. So typically, the kind of uh, uh, services that we offer, data download service, that was the one that I was illustrating just now. Data streaming is similar to data download, except that it streams up uh, a MIME type. So if your workspace is creating, say, KML or PDF, uh, when you click on that service, it will straight away open the output in those uh, applications. You can also upload files. Well, we did that as well. We uploaded a CSV file to run it and then downloaded the results. And then there are other services available, scheduling and notification that uh, you can used to have more control over the job management. So a couple of examples of uh, customers who have used uh, FME server or are using it quite extensively, the Arkansas Geo Store. Uh, as I mentioned, the web pages that we supply with server are really examples and we do expect users to take those and uh, customize and that's what these uh, uh, colleagues have done. Uh, so the Arkansas Geo Store have built a very nice, I think it's a very nice metadata search engine that you can uh, search for um, different things uh, on their data warehouse. It'll come up with uh, imagery or vector data that they have. Uh, once you've selected that, you can view it in simple ways, view it as thumbnails. And when you click on it, here you can start to see the similarity now with the FME server. So this is where FME server starts to kick in. They've allowed you to clip the data or select it by county, city boundary, and so on, so all sorts of different boundaries, uh, obviously by the state boundary as well. They've restricted the list of formats that you can output to uh, in a nice way, and also they've restricted the list of coordinate systems to coordinate systems which are pertinent to uh, the state of Arkansas. And then if I put in my e email address here, and then request the data, that uh, job request to be sent back to their FME server, and instead of getting a URL page back, I will get an email back with that um, FTP link where the data that I ordered uh, came from. City of Surrey have taken a slightly different approach, probably a more common approach uh, for our FME server. Um, and that is they've integrated FME server with Arc server. So this is uh, driven by uh, uh, Arc server, I believe. They've uh, given a very simple list of the kind of data sets they uh, allow users to download. So if I'm, in, if I'm a property developer, I might want to see the property boundaries of the surrounding area for a new subdivision I'm building, maybe the transportation layers. They restricted the request to just two formats, and they're, they're just going to give you uh, uh, the coordinate system that they're giving you. It's probably a UTM coordinate system. And again, I can put in my email address, draw a box around uh, more or less where our offices are, and again, if I click download here, I'll get an email with that link, FTP link, back to the data set. So I think that's a nice uh, example of using FME server integrated into a mapping environment. Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, we do give a bit more of a detailed uh, um, webinar on FME server. So um, if the, the integration of desktop to server it does seem to interest you, you can uh, follow up uh, by registering for that. Yeah, and so um, getting started, we have a lot of uh, free online resources. <clears throat> we have a tutorial, which is great, and on-demand training. Um, where you could you could learn uh, on, at your own pace, but uh, one of the things that we're excited about is the instructor-led online training, and that's all free. Um, we we'll use Amazon um, Web Services, so you don't need to have FME and you don't need to have data, and uh, it is instructor-led, which means someone like Mark or somebody on Mark's team will be doing the training, and 
Um, it's as if you're there, except the benefit of being in your own home in your PJs or in the office. Um, and it's uh, typically two days, if it's a desktop course, four hours um, in the morning Pacific Standard Time. Oh, there's one coming up a couple of weeks. Perfect. So June, or yeah, June 25th and 26th. So the time is uh, 8.30 to 12.30 uh, Pacific Daylight uh, Time. And uh, yeah, please uh, feel free to register. If you don't have the product, that's no problem. Or if you have the product, then maybe the maintenance is expired. Or hey, maybe you're just uh, snooping around and you don't, you're not sure whether FME can help you on a certain project or whether it might work in your organization. Take the training. It's a good way to vet whether or not our product is the right tool for you. If that seems a little lengthy, certainly go on to our on-demand. Uh, the, all the training, uh, the desktop training there is uh, in an online um, course with videos. Uh, we've got some more compact tutorials that you can take as well and uh, that's a very good starting point to go into mm -hmm. the desktop and so on uh, there so I certainly encourage you to explore any of those means depending on how much time uh, you have. Yes and, and if you go to the front of our website there's a, a button and it asks you new to FME and if you click it this is the page you get so this is a great uh, um, landing page with uh, a lot of the resources to uh, to get going. So lots of demo movies. They're short um, and very succinct about specific uh, things you can do in FME. Uh, the webinars are longer; they're about an hour long. Um, you yeah. have uh, lots of examples of using FME in different areas with spatial databases, with KML, with raster, and they also have example workspaces there that you can look at. Yeah, and, and you can register for upcoming uh, webinars, but uh, if you missed one, don't worry about it because for the last year and a half we've recorded them all. Yeah, and then at the bottom there, you if, if you want to explore it further, uh, grab a free trial yep. and um, you can actually try and work with the product itself. And I think that probably wraps us up for the day. Is Absolutely. Correct? If you have any questions, um, feel free to send them into info at safe.com. I mean, if it's if you're using a trial license and you have a, an actual technical question, then um, you can use uh, Mark's team and they'll be happy to help you out. And that's safe.com/support. But uh, again, thanks so much for joining us.